some notes for you to look at to keep the books we can't sell here and trade for you know the use of this wonderful room for free so take a book they're there there's some more in the box you know where I am you'll find me you'll give me something <laughs> uh, but I would love for you to have the book as well and that's a book that wrote and I'll be talking about Zugaya um, and the publisher was so befuddled by the content that we didn't know how to place it and so we did a young adult placement for it um, which may or may not work uh, but the point is it's a cautionary tale about a vision I had that I'll talk to you tonight about and read a few uh, sections from the book to express kind of the sense of what the story was about, is about. But let me introduce it a bit first. Uh, so wonderful to be here with you. Thanks for coming out on a Tuesday evening and all your busy lives. We've been through a lot. This is our eighth lecture in the Bozeman Lecture Series. Um, you can find the other seven on YouTube. We're filming again tonight for that same purpose. That's what we're filming for. So that other people who don't have the opportunity to come sit with us can be exposed to this material. So the idea here is that there's a relationship between psyche, the soulfulness of our existence, the generative, nurturing, creative aspect of our inner world, the world that we call Mother Earth, the planet, or Gaia, and the imagination. So, the three words I put on the top of the way of Gaia on the notes was imagine, image, imagine, imagination, and the other word would be the imaginal. I'm going to talk about moving into imaginal reality as an option for what it means to be alive with this earth. In other words, there's so much chaos, confusion, tension, anger, conflict in the world today that there's only one move that I can figure out to make, and that's why I want to talk to you about it tonight, because I feel responsible to let you know. <laughs> And that move has something to do with what this looks like. So this stack uh, is on the Kootenai River, where the Yak and the Kootenai confluence in northwest Montana, 425 miles that way. I love our state. I can drive all the way to Salt Lake City in our own state. And I started halfway in the middle of it. So. Big story in this country, big country. And my meditation when I go and retreat each year to the same place where I gather my cedar for the year for my ceremonies and for blessing the office between sessions, uh, I go and sleep under the same cedar trees and I'll harvest the cedar that I wrap and use for that purpose. And the meditation I do is I build stacks. Um, actually, I built, I got a little carried away this year. <laughs> I, I built about 25 stacks, and uh, it became quite the little event, and uh, people would take pictures, and this was a professional photographer from Seattle 
who thought that was worthy of a photo and he took it and sent it to me and I share it with you this evening. Because if there's something that has to do with balance in nature and the sense of what that looks like, it's this to me. So that's the meditation. <laughs> so nature inspires our imagination that in turn returns us to nature. So many of you have spent much of your time on this planet choosing to live here in nature. But what I want to do is take it a further <clears throat> step and suggest that Earth, Gaia, you, Psyche, the imagination are all the same thing. There's no difference. As a matter of fact, to cut to the chase, the suffering you experience is the disconnect through your intellect and through your thinking function from that union that's always been the case. I could prove that scientifically, but I'll leave that to my buddy David Quammen to do that. He likes science. I like mythology, and we're best friends. So we get along well in a complementary way to understand the origin of life on this planet. So the science of it, obviously, is just aside to that for a moment, that the molecules embedded in the elements that were in the rocks of our planet, of Gaia's bones, were activated by water that freed up the molecules that were able to reconfigure and began the process of DNA. So we literally come from the rocks. That's not a question except for, it could be if you had a different kind of belief system. But the point of it is that we all come from this earth and are this earth. It's not a separation. So in Christian mythology, in the Western worldview of Christian mythology, we began in the garden. And then old pesky Eve gave Adam an apple, and he took a bite of that, and they became self-aware, self-conscious, and started thinking about things, the tree of knowledge. So I'll be referring to Greek mythology, where Gaia comes from, but imagine that we're saying the same thing. The origin story is that once you start thinking about yourself and gain self-consciousness, you are no longer connected to Gaia. You have separated yourself in some sort of schizophrenic way. Some sort of disassociative split starts to happen when you no longer realize that you're not like on the planet Earth. You are Gaia's expression. It's not like, oh, that's a fun metaphor. That's cute. That's enchanting. That's romantic. <clears throat> that's not where I'm going with this. We've been there. We've done that. The romantic poets have done great things to inspire us by the beauty of the landscape and the beauty of the mountains. I'm not talking about voyeurism here, about saying how wonderful the planet is, and I get to live on it. I'm suggesting that until we remember that we are it, we will continue to try to save the planet while losing ourselves. Guy is fine. She's been fine before we came to pay a visit. She'll be fine after we leave. But the question is, in order to access the relationship to Gaia that I'm here to ask you, to beg you, to sing about, to realize, is that of being in balance in your own psyche. There is no other move in my book. 
and I've had the good fortune of listening to people for 35 years and understanding what we all suffer from in many ways. And what I'm suggesting is the degree to which you think you are separate from Gaia is the extent to which you will neurotically suffer. So, Gaia, Mother Earth, in the Greek mythology, was one of the original five elements. There were four others. Tartarus, the underworld, where you go each night, you go into your underworld, and you dream, you see things in the underworld. Most of the time, most of us forget the dreams because in the mythology you have to cross the river Lethe and that's to get back to the waking world and you usually do that with a radio and an alarm or a cell phone so good luck with remembering your dreams because the river Lethe that you cross to come back to the surface is the river of forgetting. To remember who we are in relationship to each other in the planet is the hardest memory to keep alive because of the distractions of this world and specifically the way you think repetitively about the same things. So Gaia theory posits that the organic and inorganic components of planet Earth have evolved together as a single living self-regulating system. So what that means to me is that the way in which I experience my neurotic suffering, and I did plenty of that today before coming here to talk to you tonight. <laughs> I my damnedest not to go there, but it didn't work. But what did work is I was sitting on my couch, and I, we have an 18-year-old uh, cat named Clancy. Uh, Clancy loves to be held and loves to be loved. And Clancy came up in my lap and I'm sitting there. I'm choosing not to watch the news before I come here. I thought that was smart. Um, I was home alone and Clancy came up on my lap and I just started holding him actually. And after time went by, 10, 15 minutes, I went, huh, I'm good now. <laughs> and it was the joy of hearing him purr, purr and his trust and his warmth that helped me remember who I was because my brain was very chaotic in the sense of, well, Who's going to be there? Is everything going to work? Is Cole going to find me? Should I go get flowers? Of course I should go get flowers. How about yeah. Cole? Do they have a music band? I don't know. You know how we go. But the cat saved my ass. He just said <laughs> So our personal internal primal schism is to believe that we are separate from God. This estranged state is a source of our discontent and our suffering. The ascendancy of our thinking function and its dominance in both our repetitive self-criticism and obsessive thinking partnering with the worship of unleashed rationality as a modern god alienates us from Gaia's images like our rivers, meadows, and mountains. So these are sonic bites. I'm just going to hit you with these and then it'll rattle around in your imagination or not. And it might come up, for instance, in dreams or in conversations. And we'll have a chance to talk a little tonight uh, after I present some of my ideas here. We are no more separate from Gaia than we are from our genetics the molecules of which were recombined from their mineral origin once water dissolved the rock, housing them, and lightning sparked the reconstituted molecules into animated life. That's my fantasy. I think it's true, 
but I'm not saying it's true. It's my myth that I'm sharing with you. Can you imagine molecules recombining in the water of life and lightning charging it up like some original Frankenstein movie mm -hmm. where all we needed was that high intensity lightning and he would come to life. But actually that's not very far-fetched because we are that. I was uh, reading, maybe saw in the Chronicle this morning, uh, a story about the neutron star collision that created the gravity waves that they've been setting up instruments sensitive enough to register and they, read, they came through our corner of the universe uh, in August. Hello, they've been traveling at the speed of light for 150 million years. <laughs> and we get worked up because I can't pay my bill. So anyway, there's, there's this whole animated relationship in the cosmos that's begging you to remember that you are it. <clears throat> so this is how it went for me as Psyche informed me of how Gaia wished to be known through the story I wrote. Imagine that this story, your dreams, and nature herself is both a reflection of and an embodiment of Psyche. Imagine that this story, your dreams, and nature herself is both a reflection of and an embodiment of Psyche. So let me set up the story here for a moment and read you a passage. So, uh, in the fall, about this time of year, in 2011, um, after having studied archetypal psychology with its founder, James Hillman, for 20 years, who became a good friend and mentor, and who some of you have seen when I brought him to town in the early 2000s a number of times, has this idea that images and I hate to use this word, but images trump thoughts. <laughs> images, the imaginal world, seeing in your own way, seeing, whether it be the inspiration of nature or whether it be the dreams you're having, the imaginal world is the way through the tyranny of thought. Yet he was very academic, wrote 20 books that nobody could understand until he hit a winner with The Soul's Code because uh, one of the talk show people, Oprah, is that Oprah? Oprah or Oprah? Oprah. <laughs> Had him on the show when he was in here actually in Montana. We were grooving in uh, the hot springs and uh, outside of Anaconda, what, Fairmont, after a lecture tour we'd been on, and he got the call. He said, hey, I'd like you on my show. And uh, he went on the show, and two months later, he was on the New York West seller list with 350,000 copies sold. Yeah. You never know. I think that's called lightning. Anyway, the images, that he writes about, even in an intellectual way, are the way that you see yourself reflected in the world. You can't know yourself unless you see yourself in the world. What you're left with if you only think about yourself is everything you thought repetitively for as long as you can remember. We have maybe 222 thoughts that keep grinding on us. You know them. <laughs> 222. <laughs> Some of you have maybe a thousand. But those repetitive thoughts are an expression of the division between what is real, and that is that you are Gaia. So I made a list of archetypes. I go, 
What the hell is an archetype? Um, and you might remember, maybe some of you were around, four years ago I did a chaka cha uh, on the term archetype. They had the courage enough to let me roll with it. And all I did was show images. So there I was thinking about what is an archetype, and I made a list, two, li two rows of terms, archetypes, on a legal pad, went to sleep, and that night, Aurora came for a visit. And Aurora, the Greek word for dawn, told me a story. And I feverishly wrote it down over two weeks. And then wrote it for the next six months. And then didn't know what to do with it. And it stayed dormant for three years. And then a publisher who, Jackie here, hi Jackie, whose uh, book Laundry for Strangers was an event that we shared here uh, last year or the year before. Um, through her connections, we were able to get the book published. The problem was in the rush to get it a part of a uh, shipment that went to China to be printed, it didn't get a final edit, and it didn't get a final proofreading from an independent reader. And so there are 20 some mistakes sprinkled through this book, which bugged the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Made me really self conscious. And so I didn't have a chance to share it in a way that I wanted to with a <coughs> larger public, but I wanted to at least share it with people who would come to the library and hear me read a bit of it because I felt. Aurora would then get pissed off if I didn't pay attention to what she has, what she was here to say. So the idea behind this book and the vision that I had was that the world is depending on Aurora, coal, women, the feminine, to remember their inextricable connection to Mother Earth. The patriarchy has had a hell of a run for the last 5,000 years. Way to go, guys. We did great things. And we did awful things, and we continue to do that. And we are each other. There's a masculine function in every woman, and there's a feminine function in every man. But you get what I'm saying. The extractive idea that was birth through certain interpretations of the Christian mythology around the dominion over the world has paid, a, we paid a price for that. And so Gaia tagged Aurora as an avatar to go on a mission because Gaia was getting pretty worked up. Gaia was getting furious. And so Aurora is a 15-year-old girl in Mammoth Hot Springs. Her dad's a backcountry ranger in the northwest part of the park. Her mom teaches at Gardner High. She's a no-nonsense young woman, loves to be in nature, and she starts hearing a voice that she doesn't pay attention to and dismisses. But she loves to take walks with her ranger dad on Sunday weekend afternoons. And this is what starts to generate in her a sense of alienation and confusion about what's going on with Gaia, although she doesn't know any of this yet. So Aurora loved Sunday afternoons. It was when she and her dad took time to walk the landscape that to millions of others was a vacation destination. One of her favorite walks was to discover hidden coolies chock full of mold, <coughs> mold 
bedded down pronghorn, red tail hawk nesting grounds, and rattlesnake dens. Over the years, Stuart, her dad, taught her about the way animals inhabit these fecund gullies. Rich with plant life and fed by seeping springs, these protected places offered solace from swirling winds and cover from driving rain and snow under moss decorated rock overhangs. Lately though, their talks bugged her. I don't know if any of you can remember being a 15 year old girl. Or any parents here remember those couple years, 14, 15, 16? Pretty lively. Lately though, her talks bugged her. Tired of his repetitive credo about how rangers work for the good of the park, hence the earth, she observed that these same rangers drove SUVs, patrolled the same territory over and over, and had a sense of superiority, what with a crisp brown uniform and snappy ranger hat, gun on hip. Also, Aurora was now paying attention to her parents' conversations. It sounded more and more canned. Her mom's attitude toward global warming was clothed in tie-dye colors, swirling, nostalgic, meadow-dancing, groovy deadheads who sang the same songs for the last 30 years. Her classroom walls were covered with posters featuring rainbows and misty lakes. Her poems about Mother Earth began sounding more like nursery rhymes than laments. Her enthusiasm for Coltrane protests sounded more like scripture than fury. Her weak and her weeknight meetings with her gal friend, Save Paradise Valley, seem corny, not relevant. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Aurora was getting a little agitated at the party line, even though it was super important. Maybe that was it, she considered, while striding next to her dad, who was uncharacteristically quiet, appeared distant and withdrawn. Maybe it is the hypocrisy of humans that disturb her the most. Maybe this was a term she was really only now understanding. It meant to her that adults seemed to talk one way and behave another way. It all seemed safe and confined. Her teachers lectured her on health and stumbled out of bars drunk. Her dad preached wildlife habitat and dug ruts into the earth with his four-wheel drive pickup. Her mom carried on about the plight of Gaia, of Mother Earth, and collapsed in front of conflict with authority figures. Critters don't have hidden motives. They jumped, flew, ran, killed, devoured, prowled without thinking about how they looked. Aurora's agitation surfaced when she abruptly said to her dad, why do you work for the Park Service instead of flying solo as an activist for Earth issues? Aren't you part of the problem, working for an institution instead of being on the front lines of environmental activism? Whoa, what? I have to provide for you and your future, don't I? It's easy for you to be a dreamer, but I need to bring home the bacon. What's got into you? I thought you respected what I do as compared to some dick who digs mines and pollutes our rivers. Sure I do, Dad, but it feels like everything we do is a rehearsal, not the reality. I mean, I'm about ready to take action, to somehow draw attention to the fate of this world in a direct way. I don't know. Isn't it all too late and silly and convenient? I'm so disgusted. I want to take some form of direct action, like blow up Canyon Ferry Dam. <laughs> hey, 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 settle down, girl. We're, you're way too young to talk like that craziness. We all have to make compromises. You think I'm looking for the man while well, I'm just doing my best to provide? Wait till you get to my age. You'll see. I don't think I will get to be your age. Mm -hmm. Striding on in silence, a rift tore between them like a dress caught on a rusty edge. So the urgency of leading a balanced life is what I'm here to talk about. No cause, no distraction, no protest will have the effect 
that living a balanced life will produce. In other words, there are so many things that we can get worked up about, and believe me, I do, as I know many of you do. There's so many concerns and fears that we have about the fate and future of our planet. But there's one thing we've overlooked, and that is our responsibility to be in harmony with ourselves and with nature. That just seems too something or other, too cute, too mythic, too psychological, too simple. But I can tell you that the urgency of this story that came through me and what I've been captivated now by for the last six years is that the world is you looking back at you asking for your attention. The resources we need from the world are the resources we need from ourselves. The simplicity of this is almost naive sounding when I think it and speak. But the reality of it is that the harmony and balance of being with this world and being in relationship to Gaia, ourselves, is the task of our imagination. You can't think your way through this. The lawsuits against things that happen, yes. All the activism that we have, yes. All the reporting and the films about this, yes. But on a personal level, which is the only level that is real for us, because that's our experience in this body, <coughs> is how to imagine, how to see the way that we are. So, that means creativity. The imagination, the imaginal, and creativity become the way through this false division that has been created by an over-rational approach to trying to understand who we are in this world and what the world is all about. Are we all not overheating even as our environment does so? Is that too abstract? Consider all the global hot spots, let alone the heat of personally overstimulated human systems, and I'd have to say we are all in this together. The all here refers to all, in bold and capitals, of who we are, including our living planet. This is an obvious, almost naive assumption. What it means or represents is the question. Imagine that it might mean there is a translucent blood flow between all aspects of nature that nourishes and forms and suffers. I can't say it better than that. Imagine that it might mean there is a translucent blood flow between all aspects of nature that nourishes, informs, and suffers. Can you see that? Can you represent that? Can you live that? Can you feel that? Can you be that? Like the perspective of an aerial view of a delta's fan lived in by countless millions, or a panoramic shot of mountains pouring down water to the valleys, and all the folk downstream, this body Gaia, dynamically intertwined with all of creations, holds us and is us. Imagine that there is no separation from this earth and ourselves. Okay, this is a kind of room that says, what do you mean? <laughs> this feels a little disconnected here. We've got neon lights, we've got they're probably not asbestos tiles. I think we got through that. 
There's carpet. There's plastic. <laughs> There's a separation going on here. Let's not be silly. The point that I'm driving home, or wanting to, is that the peace that comes from realizing that you are not separate from the earth is an invitation that I'm offering us to remember and activate in your own way, in your own life. <coughs> so, koyanaskansi is a Hopi word for an unbalanced life. It was also the title of a 1982 film with music by Philip Glass, featuring music and images but no dialogue. If you haven't seen that movie, I would recommend you see it. It, began, it begs the question in my mind of how can we expect a balance in nature when we as human manifestations of nature are out of balance in our personal lives? How can you expect that? How can we expect that? To imagine however many billions of us are here now, in balance is some far-fetched idea. But that doesn't excuse each one of us from the responsibility I'm talking about of striving to be in balance with nature, our nature, and Gaia. Because if you're not in balance, another part of the Greek mythology is if you're not in balance with yourself, with the mother, and if the feminine principle is violated, something starts to happen. Gaia's pals, the Furies, are released. You don't want that. <laughs> Meaning simply, over the last two months, it felt like the Furies were already out from the underworld with the series of hurricanes and the fires and the heat. I know these are cycles and all of this can be dismissed and that's fine. I'm just suggesting it started to feel like that. It started to feel like Gaia had unleashed some of the Furies, just going, hey. And that's where this story goes. So in other words, the first book in this trilogy, Zugaya, Earth's Vengeance, is about the way in which a girl goes on a journey guided by animals to the west coast where she has an encounter that if you read the story, you'll see what happens. But the way along the path is the nature of the story. And she is guided by the voice of the animals. So hearing voices. Now that's an interesting idea. As a professional psychotherapist, that's often called schizophrenia. As a working psychotherapist, the alienation that I experience in people's stories from their connection to the world has created a competitive, desperate, frantic, anxious driven obsession with trying to get ahead of something that they're not sure of, we're not sure of what it is that we have to control. The animals in this story relate to Aurora, that that's all behind us now. That way of being on this planet and in your life is an old repetitive story that no longer applies. This is about remembering the ground of our lives, the roots we share with the earth, how we are perceived, <coughs> as not being a living, breathing manis excuse me, manifestation of nature is beyond me. I really can't grasp that. How that alienation has so devastatingly occurred, so completely, 
as an embodiment of nature's life force, humankind is as vulnerable to imbalance in their ecosystem as is the grizzly bear in his. One more reading, and then we'll open it up for some questions or comments. So, you've walked to the Boiling River, many of you have. I love that walk. I love the, the cedars, the uh, rocks. Um, Aurora had an encounter one night after a party at the Chief Ranger's house, that wonderful craftsman style house next to uh, Mammoth Hot Springs features, that Lingham, that great sandstone or calcified earth structure and the pools. She comes home and let me see if I can find this page here quickly. Um, excuse me. Aurora felt a conflict within her. She had come home a bit drunk, a bit high, a bit wasted. When I was talking about writing this and was trying to get it published, the young adult book I had to change my language in some of the references, but for us, that's what her state was. <laughs> she came home, they have one of those wonderful army barrack houses on the quad there, those rock houses. She's in that house. Aurora woke up with a start, tangled in damp sheets. She sits bolt upright, wrangling herself free. What the hell is that crashing sound? Is it coming from downstairs or outside? Free from entangled bedclothes, yet reeling from the evening's overindulgence, Aurora stumbles toward her bedroom door. Her bedroom is across from the stairs and down the hall from her parents' bedrooms, whose door was shut. Why isn't that awful noise waking mom? She mumbles as she picks her way down the stairs, sliding her hand along the worn walnut wood banister. As she lands on the cool fir wood plank floor, she shakes off a dream image of a bear attacking. She jumps off the last step out into the front door's mat, onto the front door's mat. Shit! I had to change that to shoot. Shit! <laughs> the locked front door smashes open, exposing a standing sow grizzly, wearing a silver armor breastplate, a quiver, and holding a longbow. Before Aurora had time to deliberate, the sow grabbed her around her waist with her free, shaggy, outstretched arms, spun around, and bolted down the chipped concrete steps, bounding around, bounding around the house, past the alert bell, bull elk, who winked, and on down through the maintenance shops to the side lawn of the stone Episcopal Chapel perched above the road to the Lamar Valley. Aurora was limp with terror, mute with horror. Then it got even more interesting. The sow spoke. Aurora, your time has come. Your life is no longer yours. Your destiny is in charge now. We can't wait any longer. The darkness around us is deep. You have been chosen for the rendezvous. Rendezvous? Aurora repeated desperately, clutching the word like a life ring. Yes, said the armored sow, easing her grip, but still holding Aurora and, well, a bear hug. You see, child, it is your destiny to rendezvous with ambassadors of our next epoch, dawning. It's your task to complete the journey, making it to the rendezvous point on time. And where might that point in time be, Aurora said with a hint of disdain, not lost on the sow but the matter-of-fact tone employed by the bear both comforted and disturbed Aurora's sense of normality. 
Here she was, in the clutches of a bear, wearing armor, whose long bow and glistening quiver laid atop fallen maple leaves strewn across the groomed lawn of the stone chapel on the day of the dead eve, listening to her talk sensibly, yet strangely. The bear's voice was fierce, yet not aggressive, forceful, but like an orator, direct, yet unintimidatingly telling her about destiny and fate that were known words to Aurora, yet foreign concepts. And was this a teaching moment? Had the world of daily routine of waking up to an alarm, of answering a knock on the door, and receiving a package from FedEx, of attending school and doing her assignments gone? Or was it just a dream, a trick of her mind from the night before? The sow spoke again. I'm letting you go now, but don't try to, fee to flee. I'm really fast. Couldn't think of it, Aurora responded as she eyed the nearest tree whose branches were way too high to reach anyway. She did back away, though, and stood her ground, however shaky it was. Jake the Wolverine will be your guide. He'll come by soon. He'll watch over you from a distance, keeping an eye on your progress. He won't intervene unless you are in mortal danger. He will be your guide on your journey. You will also hear a voice in your head that will prompt you at various crosswords. Be still enough in your own head and you'll hear it just fine. One message has already been delivered. It came in a dream, remember? You mean the 11th hour dream? Aurora replied. That's right. Well, that time has come, and it's your turn to take the role of she who knows. The bear said this with a trace of melancholy in her raspy voice. Aurora was trembling by now, was weak, was bewildered. So, in a whiny voice, squeaked, I don't know anything right now. I'm terrified. I'm annoyed, and I'm being held hostage by a fierce talking bear. I want to go home. Please let me go home. At this, the sow roared. That's the last cry of the victim. I'm not holding you. You are free to go. There's no further comfort. No one is going to save you. Dig deep, girl, and remember who you are and where you came from. You must leave on your own terms without reacting against me or seeking comfort with what you thought was true. This is your moment, Aurora. Farewell. At this, the bear grabbed her quiver and bow, strung a feathered arrow of fluorescent quills, spun around, and shot Aurora through the heart. <laughs> to finish with, <clears throat> then let's see what you have to say. Um, I'd love to read The New Yorker. Uh, I read it from cover to cover every Monday. And this last Monday's, October 16th, uh, The New Yorker magazine, maybe you know it. Uh, keeps me sane, you know, I read about what's going on in New York that night and think, ah. But it's got a wonderful voice to it, it's got a, critiques our collective normal society fairly well. In the theater section of it, I ripped it out, um, there was this quote that this guy or a statement this guy wrote that I want to quote because it brings it together in the responsibility I'm trying to encourage you to embrace, which is to be in balance and let go of every other distraction and give up on the noise and come home to your relationship with Gaia because she's you and you're her, okay? That. <laughs> <laughs> so he's writing about this playwright and he describes him as such. Oliver is so brave that it cracks your self-protective reserve and makes you ashamed, too, for all the conventional behavior and thought you hold on to. Just because you think it will shield you, mostly from your own fears about your own difference. So the way this comes together is you have had an experience of being born. You were socialized into a reality 
that your parents did their best to convince you of. You adopted, and you've heard me talk about this, I'm just summarizing, a persona to manage the agreements that were made before you had a say in what they were. It's called childhood. This persona, the way you present to the world to protect yourself from the difference that you are, it's attached like some sort of adhesive mask. At one point in your life or another, you'll have an opportunity to crack that mask. Like birds have an egg tooth that crack the shell from within. So do you have that opportunity to crack that persona shell? Then you have an opportunity, and this comes from age 12 to around 45, 50. After that, people get a little too tired and miss the bus. <laughs> if you go through some rite of passage or initiation or traumatic experience, you have a moment where you crack out of that persona and experience your character, which is your unique daemon in the Greek word of genius, your unique genius. Your unique genius, your daemon, your character, all synonyms, are, is your access to reunion with Gaia. Character, imagination, creativity, cracking the egg of the persona, is the only way I know, and I've been taught a lot of ways that people have told me we can do this, and none of them work. The only way I know that you can reunite with the kind of energy, vitality, and beauty that you see in nature that is actually a projection of your own genius looking back at you. That's my best shot.
And I'm having a hard time containing my emotions right now. Speaking of, you were talking about people who are super sensitive, yeah. and I feel very sensitive to that right now. So, I um, you come over here. I need yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but if you want to hear the song, I do have it. I will be recording it soon. So. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I think you just rewrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you for coming. <laughs>